you ever wonder why so many people believe in evolution? It just seems so far-fetched. How can so many smart scientists honestly believe that all living things descended from a single common ancestor over billions of years? Hi, my name is Gordon J. Glover, author of Beyond the Firmament, and this is part one of three of a short video series I'm putting together called What's So Great About Evolution? You can also visit my website at www.beyondthefirmament.com or get my book on Amazon. Many Christians have been led to believe that evolution was invented by secular scientists just so atheists can explain creation without reference to God. On the surface, this seems to be a valid claim. After all, who are the most vocal supporters of evolution? It seems like no matter where you look, the most ardent defenders of evolution are obnoxious atheists. So I can certainly understand why most Christians don't want anything to do with evolution. But the problem with equating evolution with atheism is that there are many strong believers in the scientific community who also accept evolution as a valid model of creation. And I'm not just talking about liberal Christians, but conservative Christians who believe that the Bible is the word of God and that God created the heavens and the earth from nothing and that he sustains their very existence, just as the Bible says. So what's going on here? Have these Christians who accept evolution been misled by the secular scientists? Are they confused about whether to believe Moses or Darwin? Or could the theory of evolution serve some other useful purpose that all scientists, both Christian and atheists, can all agree on? Fact. Atheism does indeed require everything in nature to have a godless explanation. If you choose not to believe in God, then there are simply no other alternatives. But is it fair to then equate evolutionary science with atheism? After all, don't all scientific models attempt to explain what we find in nature without supernatural influence? Now let's think about this for a minute. Consider the meteorological sciences. When scientists study the Earth's atmosphere and attempt to make an accurate forecast, is it helpful to invoke God as the designer, creator, and ruler of the Earth's weather? I mean, after all, the Bible does tell us that God is the one who makes clouds rise from the ends of the Earth and who sends lightning with the rain and brings the wind out from his storehouses. So why don't Christians take offense when books about meteorological science fail to acknowledge God's role in the weather? Does this mean that all meteorologists are atheists who hate God? Well, of course not. All good meteorologists try to explain the weather in terms of natural forces acting on local differences in temperature and pressure. And this has nothing to do with atheism. It's just good science. So, if we are willing to recognize that good meteorological science ignores supernatural influence, despite our theological belief that God rules the atmosphere, why should we treat the biological sciences any differently? Or what about the medical sciences? What do you call doctors who ignore standard medical practice and instead turn to supernatural diagnosis and treatment? Well, we call them witch doctors. A good doctor, on the other hand, tries to diagnose sickness and disease in terms of natural cause and effect, and he prescribes treatments accordingly, without any reference to God who created us in the first place. Well, what's going on here? The Bible clearly tells us that it is God who heals all our diseases. So does this mean your doctor is an atheist? Well, of course not. Again, if we are willing to recognize that good medical science ignores supernatural influence, despite our belief that God made us and takes care of us, why should we treat the biological sciences any differently? So perhaps the theory of evolution is no more atheistic than, say, germ theory, meteorological theory, or quantum theory. And if that is the case, then perhaps it does have some valid scientific merit. Perhaps the idea of common descent is a useful scientific model that helps explain what biologists, paleontologists, and geneticists observe in nature. And if so, then maybe this whole idea of evolution is really nothing more than a modern scientific version of the ancient creation account. Nobody alive today was around to see creation, but we do have some promising leads. The Bible tells us that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and all living things. A straightforward reading of the Genesis creation account seems to indicate that everything we see today was made in its present form only a few thousand years ago. We'll call this the special creation model. We also live in a world that is littered with many physical clues that all seem to suggest that creation might have happened gradually, over many billions of years, and that all creatures alive today have descended from earlier forms in an unbroken chain of common ancestry all the way back to the first living cell. This is known as the evolutionary creation model. So we have two different creation models to choose from. How do we know which one is right? Can they both be right? Could they both be wrong? Now, if we're just talking about theology, then there were obviously very good reasons why God inspired Moses to provide the Hebrews with the Genesis account. 
In fact, I devote several chapters in my book to demonstrating the infinite wisdom of God in giving us the Genesis account exactly as it was written. But remember our examples of medicine and meteorology. When the Bible talks about nature, the focus isn't really on the technical details, which would have been of little concern to ancient Near Eastern cultures. What the Bible relates to us are the theological details of creation, which should be relevant for all people throughout history. So if we're talking about which creation model has more theological merit, then we obviously have to go with the biblical account. Science is not even equipped to answer theological questions. But if we're talking about which creation model has more scientific merit, then we need to set aside our theological concerns and conduct a different kind of analysis. In other words, we need to see which model of creation can best explain the physical data we find scattered throughout the universe apart from theological concerns. I hope you'll join me in part two as we compare the modern evolutionary model of creation, which assumes that all living things have descended from a single common ancestor, to the traditional pre-scientific model of creation, which assumes a sudden appearance of all living things in their current form.